Hello my goblins and ghouls, my name is Steven. New shop who dis? <laughs> well, kind of, I'm still working on getting it set up. I just kind of have just these two tables ready, but everything else is still in boxes. So because I can't do some actual index work, I'm gonna be addressing a bunch of questions I've been getting about the project as a whole and where it's going and why I'm doing it. I. Okay, first thing, why is this project important? In 2018, I did a project called the Glow Tie, which was a pretty simple little device. It had a 3D printed part, a circuit board, firmware to flash onto it. It wasn't that complicated. I think it had like 25 different separate components on the board. When it came time to actually make them, I had to make a hundred of them. And I thought this wasn't gonna be too difficult, but it was grueling, hand placing over 3000 components, putting them in my little toaster oven and sometimes blowing out an LED because I didn't really know what I was doing, manually programming all of them by hand. It was really, it was annoying. <laughs> Not to mention all the like 3D printed parts that I had to like manually remove and finish and assemble. Now, if I'd only been making 20 of them, that would have been fine. If I had to make 20,000 of them, that also would have been fine because I would have just gone to a contract manufacturer or a company that you pay to effectively be your factory. And then they would have made them for me and I would have just paid for it out of the profits from selling the glow ties. But I wasn't making 20,000 and I wasn't making 20. I was making 100. So then I started to see all of these things that were really annoying and frustrating about trying to make a product in a scale that wasn't just one or two handful of prototypes and wasn't big enough to justify going to a factory. There was this middle ground where there really wasn't an easy way to make stuff. I started calling this mid-scale manufacturing, which is roughly defined as having to make 500 to 5,000 of a unit in a year. This is the range where it's a huge pain in the butt to make the products using prototyping tools, but also not quite enough to justify going to a contract manufacturer to make it for you. So I got really excited about this and started looking at all the different ways I might be able to make that gap a little bit easier to produce within. If you dumb down most modern products into their three main constituent parts, software, electronics, and hardware physical parts. Software is pretty easy to just distribute in mass. It doesn't cost a lot extra. You can just spin up more servers or flash firmware an indefinite number of times at no extra cost. So software doesn't really need help here. It's mainly in electronics and physical parts. For physical parts, I looked at all different ways of manufacturing things, including 3D printing, urethane casting, injection molding, all the different ways you could possibly do some medium volume stuff, but not super expensive. Urethane casting is a really, really good option, but you still have to get new molds made for different iterations. It's not quite as flexible as 3D printing. It also can be a little messy and you're usually paying someone else to do it if you want any moderate scale made. You can do it yourself, but it's a bit of a pain in the butt. What I settled on as the best solution was a belt printer. And I was fully planning on making a belt printer the next project after the index until the CR30 was announced. And then I decided not to because you know what? They kind of just solved that problem. Belt printers can just run one part indefinitely and it's a little factory. It just makes all the plastic parts for you directly. It's so awesome. I love the idea of a belt printer and I'm definitely going to buy a few CR30s and test out using them in a factory-like setting and being able to make parts just in bulk, running indefinitely, big old spool of filament on there, and they can just make parts all day long. No removal needed. Ideally, the parts are designed without support. So as soon as they come off the belt, they're ready to be used. Then comes arguably the most difficult component to automate, the electronics. Getting boards fabricated is so cheap and easy to do nowadays. It's easy to learn how to design a board. It's easy to go to a board shop and have them make it for you. They come in like less than a week and they're really, really inexpensive. But the tricky thing is assembling them. Even at a prototyping level, it's still really annoying to do this. You can get a stencil and apply the paste very easily, but you're still hand placing every single one of those parts. And depending on how many parts are in your bomb, that can take forever. So it seemed like the most logical thing for me to work on to help aid with mid-scale manufacturing being easier for everybody was to make a pick and place. Now there are some existing designs out there. There are some very expensive products out there as well from companies like Charm High and Neoden, and they make machines that will do this kind of thing, maybe kind of higher end of the mid-scale manufacturing tier, maybe starting to go up into your contract manufacturer buying one of these things. But I wanted to work on something that was ridiculously open that anyone can build themselves and use it to make a product. Be able to make one of these things for dirt cheap, absolute just material cost, and fabricate boards with little to no interaction. They can spend the time doing the things that humans are good, like designing stuff, and let the machines do the fabrication work. So then I started working on the index. The point of this whole project is to make sure that anyone that wants to make or buy a pick and place for a reasonable cost to bring their product to market at some moderate scale can do so. 
And it's really important that's either buy or make. They can order stuff online and get everything that they need without some fancy injection molding die that only one person owns or some weird proprietary part that's hard to get. Everything in the bomb needs to be easily purchased and accessible to pretty much anyone in the world. Okay, so what's the plan for the index moving forward? I mentioned this briefly in the last video, but ultimately my goal is to be able to sell the index as a kit. This also likely includes selling the motherboard as a separate thing you can buy individually if you want to make the frame yourself, and then ultimately you'll be able to purchase finished feeders. Now I think the easiest thing out of all these to build is the index frame itself, so that will probably be last. The first thing I'll probably try and make available for sale will be the index motherboard, and then after that the feeders, because I think those are some of the harder ones to actually get together and working properly. But the index frame is not terribly difficult to print yourself and assemble, and it will be the hardest to actually manufacture and sell, so that will probably be the last one. The reason that I even want to sell them to begin with is twofold. First of all, getting more people actually using it is going to help find problems with the design. Right now, it's me and a bunch of awesome people on the Discord who are building it along with me and dealing with my bad documentation, but actually getting a finished sold product out there to some early beta testers is going to mean that we're gonna find so many more things to make it better. Second, it's accomplishing the goal. It's getting this product out into the world so more people can make stuff at that mid-scale level that I'm so excited about. Also, kind of a third reason, it'd just be really fun to turn my whole house into a factory. I just really like that idea. <laughs> As for when exactly this is gonna happen, I don't know. I have a very rough estimate that maybe at the end of this summer, I will start to have some boards, maybe feeders available to buy. My whole life is pretty topsy-turvy right now because of moving, all my stuff is in boxes in what will soon be my shop. But once I get everything broken out and I'm able to start diving into actual development stuff again, I'll really start looking hard at building a couple more indexes and starting to make motherboards. So last but not least, what am I gonna work on after the index? Well, once you put paste and parts on your board, it's not done. You still have other steps to do. You need to reflow the whole thing and melt all your solder paste to get all your components stuck to the board. You need to check and make sure that all the parts are on there properly. And you probably need to flash firmware to that thing too. Working on finding a good solution for automatic conveyor belt driven reflow ovens is definitely in the cards. And then after that, maybe playing around with a little bit of AOI and then probably some really cool heads to add onto an index that will be able to flash firmware to your board after it's all done. But there is one more component that doesn't really fit into these three categories of making something at a medium scale, and that's organizing all of this crap. Most of my projects only require one or two spin-ups of each board, and it's a huge pain in the butt keeping track of how many of each component I have. Imagine trying to do that on a scale where you're making like 20 or 30 of these things a day. The last thing I think is really missing in the ability to do mid-scale manufacturing well is software that tracks all of the production. This includes parts on hand, lead times for ordering things, revisions of certain parts and what needs to be sent to a print farm, what needs to be flashed firmware-wise, what pick and place file should be loaded onto all the indexes, and having all of that stem from Git commits. Part of the reason I've been so adamant about tracking all of the index production in Git and switching to FreeCAD and using KiCAD and having everything be open source and able to be tracked with Git commits is because it will make it really easy to track revisions between parts in a production setting. I have technically started working on this a little bit here and there, but this is way, 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 way far down the line. This is not something I have my eyes set on right away, but it's something I want to do. It would be cool. It would be really cool. If you look at other people that have done things like this with mid-scale manufacturing, for example, Joseph Prusa has done this with the whole print farm that they have at their factory. It was a huge pain in the butt trying to track all of the hundreds of printers that they use for making their own printers, so they made a custom piece of software that does exactly that. In fact, Joseph Prusa does a lot of mid-scale manufacturing techniques really well. They use 3D printing for making a lot of the parts, they reuse parts of the printers to produce the printers and test the printers, it's awesome. They also keep production in-house, right next door to where the engineers sit. So it's really easy to be able to just pop into the next room and fix a problem on the line instead of having to fly overseas or drive a long distance to be able to actually diagnose what's going wrong. I'm hoping that these mid-scale manufacturing techniques and machines make it easier to make stuff really close to home and being able to diagnose problems very quickly, getting your hands directly on the process of making things at a larger scale than you might have been able to do otherwise. I highly recommend watching the video from Prusa about their you know, 100,000 printer milestone. I forget exactly what the video is, but there is a part in there where he just shows all of the production, the custom equipment that they make specifically to make their printers in this kind of wonderful medium scale. 
I highly recommend it. I'll put a link in the description. You can click on it and watch the rest of it, along with a whole bunch of other videos that I have pinned about mid-scale manufacturing. If you look at people like Sion, the unexpected maker, he's trying to make all of his boards that he's selling at Adafruit from his house. And he bought pick and places in order to do this, in order to have reliable production. People are able to start making products from their home now. I think we're going to see kind of this cool new wave of manufacturing where people feel emboldened to take a thing that they've been able to make one of with all these cool new prototyping tools, laser cutters, water jets, 3D printers, and try and take it to the next level, try and sell this thing. Because they've been able to play around with prototyping tools for long enough, they can try and start making a business from it, try and start selling their products. And the easier that it is for them to be able to do that, the better. So that's kind of the lowdown. My end game is to make a company around making machines that help people in the mid-scale manufacturing tier. And I'm really excited to document the whole process on this channel. I'm hoping by the time the next video upload comes around, I have my shop back and I can actually start working on some engineering stuff again. I really, really miss it. <laughs> but I really appreciate y'all hanging with me while I kind of move my whole life and get everything set up out here. At some point, I'm going to do a proper shop tour once I have everything set up, but here's the lowdown. All right, so here's the electronics bench. It looks pretty much the same as my last apartment. I have this weird closet thing, which I'm probably gonna put a table in and make an index test bench. There's a big beam in the middle of the studio, so I'll probably just use the other side for storage and maybe a couple other benches. We'll see. And if you look out the window of the studio, there's the shop. The shop is the space of a full two car garage, which is gonna be plenty of space to set up all of my machines and eventually a big old print farm and hopefully a pick and place line. Leatherman does not a good tripod make. Come on, my dude. So them's the digs. Hopefully soon I'll be able to show you all of it when it's all set up and like properly working and well lit and soundproofed and all that good stuff. Cause this shot looks like dirt. <laughs> Get all the machines plugged in. All right, that's it for this one. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Back to unpacking.